We find ourselves in this series on the doctrines of grace in the book of Romans. This is about as good as it gets. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce once said, if the Bible is a ring, the book of Romans is the diamond on that ring. And he went further and said the apex cut of that diamond is Romans chapter 8. That's exactly where we find ourselves as we begin now uh, this new segment in this series. Uh, the Apostle Paul is the writer of the book of Romans, and he is the avid defender of sovereign grace. Uh, he understands well he was saved by sovereign grace. On that road to Damascus, he was not looking for Christ. He was not looking for the gospel. He was looking to persecute the church. And in a moment, the Lord appeared to him knocked him off his high horse, and he became a trophy of God's grace. And it was said to him that you are a chosen instrument of mine. From the moment of his conversion, Paul understood that he had been sovereignly chosen by God, not only for service, but for salvation. And throughout his ministry, as he preached and he taught, uh, this was ever at the forefront of his teaching and as we read the book of Romans, uh, we read loud and clear this truth of the sovereign grace of God. Now, to this point, we have already looked at the doctrine of total depravity or radical corruption. And we want to now, in this session, talk about the doctrine of sovereign election. Uh, this is the, a, a towering truth that is taught throughout the Bible. But here in the book of Romans, it receives special attention. In Romans 8, 9, and 11, Paul, Paul narrows his focus upon this truth of the unconditional sovereign election of God of individual sinners from before the foundation of the world. If you have your Bible, I would inv invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And, and verse 29, and, and there are more verses that I'm going to be able to cover. And the frustration for me is, is that I'm not going to be able to get my arms around everything uh, that I want to say to you, but we're going to cover the mountain peaks. And it really begins in Romans chapter 8 and in verse 29, uh, this golden chain of salvation. In verse 29, for those whom he foreknew... He also predestined. And in verse 30, it continues, those whom He predestined, He called, and those whom He called, He justified, and those whom He justified, He glorified. What is so beautiful about these verses is it begins in eternity past, and it consummates in eternity future. Uh, this covers the full span of God's uh, sal salvation. And in eternity past, these two words for new and predestined. Uh, just leap off the page. And we need to discuss this as we begin our, our thoughts on sovereign election. I, I know what some people think when they come to verse 29. They go, oh, I know what this means. This means God looks down the tunnel of time to see who will choose Him. And then God, upon seeing that, God will choose them back. We've all heard that straw man of an argument. And I want you to know, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, that idea is really grounded, I think, in, uh, in paganism um, and in just uh, idolatrous thought. It has no basis in the Word of God whatsoever. And let me give you a couple reasons why. First of all, God has never looked into the future and learned anything. <laughs> that would be such a... a, a an idolatrous, demeaning view of God, that there is some knowledge outside of God that He is acquiring as He looks into the future. Now, the fact is, God is omniscient and God knows everything immediately, eternally, perfectly. Um, and so God has never learned anything. Further, this says, for those whom He foreknew. This does not say what He foresaw it says, whom he foreknew. If it said what, that would be dealing with events and circumstances and conversions, but it does not say what. It's whom, it's individuals. 
And the reality is that the word foreknowledge means those whom God previously chose to love. Um, the word knowledge means to love. Uh, in Genesis 4 verse 1, Adam knew his wife and she conceived and gave birth to a child. Uh, the word know, even beginning in Genesis and all the way through the Bible, uh, is uh, synonymous for whom uh, God chose to love in an intimate, personal way. Uh, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. The word for uh, added as a prefix means whom he chose to love previously. And we know from the rest of the Bible that that refers to before the foundation of the world. So in Romans 8, 29, Paul makes a very strong statement that those whom God previously chose to love. And in the next chapter, in Romans 9, he will say, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And from foreknowledge, then predestination. And the word for predestination means that the destination is determined before the journey begins. Uh, it literally in the Greek means to mark out the horizon in the future. In other words, you know the destination and it, it is already determined before you ever arrive there. And so predestination follows foreknowledge in the sense that predestination makes it irrevocable. It cannot be altered or changed. So in Romans 8, it's a very strong statement on the sovereign electing love of God. When we come to Romans 9, it actually becomes much stronger. In fact, Romans 9 is the Mount Everest on this subject. And while some people can make an individual verse uh, say something other than what it really says, it's impossible to reroute an entire chapter in the Bible and cause it to say other than what it says. And in Romans chapter 9, Paul makes uh, as strong a statement, series of statements, as we find anywhere in the Bible. And beginning in verse 11, I'm going to have to just select some individual verses here. Trust me, I wish I could pull over and do the whole series on Romans chapter 9. But just to, to gather some of the, uh, the key thoughts, in verse 11, we read, For though the twins were not yet born, and that's a key phrase, not yet born, and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to His choice would stand, not because of works, but of Him who calls. Uh, nothing could be any clearer than what Paul is saying here, that before uh, Jacob and Esau were even conceived in the womb, God had already made a determinative choice by which uh, he would choose one for salvation and the other would be passed over for this salvation. In verse 12, the next verse, it, it, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. And this shows how unexpected God's choices are because we would have thought the older would have been chosen and the younger would have been passed over. Uh, the normal birth order was that the blessing would go to the older son. But here God reverses and it just shows that God's ways are above our ways and His thoughts above our thoughts. In verse 13, just as it is written, Jacob I loved and, and Esau I hated. He, he loved Jacob and set his heart upon Jacob and not because of anything good in Jacob. Verse 11 made that clear. Uh, this originates in the heart and the mind and the will of God alone. Uh, God did not love Jacob because of Jacob. God loved Jacob in spite of Jacob. Uh, actually, what I don't understand is how God could love Jacob. I do understand how God could hate Esau uh, because Esau was a sinner just like you and me. And there was every reason for God, a holy God, to, to reject Jacob and to pass him over. Uh, then in verse 14, what shall we say then? There is no injustice with God is there. And Paul answers with the strongest negative in the entire Greek language, meganoito. 
Uh, may it never be. And, and Paul raises an imaginary objector who would say, well, that's not fair. Well, what's not fair is for Jacob to go to heaven. What is fair is for Esau to go to hell. Uh, you and I do not want fair. We do not want justice with God. We want mercy and grace from God. And so Paul exposes the fallacy of someone's thinking if you were to say, well, that's not fair for God to choose one and not the other. Well, what's not fair is for God to show mercy to any. If God were to show mercy to just one, it would be amazing grace. But he has chosen a vast number so large that the Apostle John could not even count it when he was in heaven. And so he says in verse uh, 15, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. This is God speaking. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And what this is saying is that God is absolutely free to bestow his mercy upon whomever he so chooses because no one has a claim to his mercy. We only have uh, a claim to his wrath in reality. We all are deserving wrath. Uh, for God to give mercy, that means he is free to bestow such compassion on whomever he would so choose. And then in verse 16, in Romans 9, he says, So then, it does not depend on the man who wills, or on the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. That verse is so crystal clear. It's not hard to understand. It's just hard to swallow. Uh, that is an enormous portion of theology that says, bottom line, for all of our salvation... It did not depend on us. It depended entirely upon God. And so it, it did not originate with our will making a choice to believe in Jesus Christ. We did choose to believe in Christ, but only with the faith that God gave us. And we'll talk about that later. But it originated not in our will within time. It originated with God's will in eternity past. Everything is, is originating with God. And that's why in Romans eleven thirty six 36, later he will say, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So everything is proceeding from God in eternity past. And then in verses 17 and 18, we see what a discriminating choice God has made. For the scripture says to Pharaoh... For this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. It's, it's in the hands of God to do what pleases him and what most honors him. And God chooses to... To, to pour out mercy on some, and God chooses to pour out wrath on others. And then in verse 19, you will say to me then, and Paul anticipates another imaginary uh, objector. He's a very skilled debater, Paul. And so he, it's as if he's saying, I know what you're thinking. You will say to me then, why then does he still find Fault. For who can resist his will? And Paul comes down hard on that question in verse 20 and 21 as if to say, who are you? Who do you think you are to call God into account? You have crossed the line with God. Your question is too arrogant and it is too brazen. You just stop and go no further. And so he will say in verse 20, on the contrary, who are you, O oh man? who answers back to God. In other words, God doesn't owe you an explanation for why he does what he does and why he does it. The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? 
Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? And here Paul uses the imagery drawn from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18, in which all humanity is pictured like clay, marred and defiled and, and, and plagued with sin. And God is the potter who can fashion out of this clay whatsoever pleases him. And so God is pictured here as as fashioning vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor for common use. And God can use one to glorify himself by putting his mercy and grace on display. And God can bring glory to himself with the other by putting his wrath and his patience on display. And then in verse 22 of this monumental chapter, we read, What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. You know, there are some clever people who try to reinterpret this as saying, well, this is not God choosing for salvation. It's God choosing for service. Well, I want to tell you, there's far more going on here than, than being a nursery worker. Uh, we're talking about eternal destinies. Uh, we're talking about being a, a vessel of grace or a vessel of wrath. And the issue here is God giving, choosing to give salvation to those whom he has chosen to save and passing over the others and allowing them to remain in their sin and to receive the due penalty of their sin as they justly deserve. Romans chapter 9 is the Mount Everest in the Bible on this doctrine of sovereign election. He continues into chapter 11 uh, in verse 2, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? No, those whom God foreknew, it is, it is an irrevocable sovereign choice that he has made. In fact, in verse 29, he will say, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That, that is a strong word, my friend. It, it cannot be altered. It cannot be changed. Those whom God chose in eternity past, it is certain that at the appointed time, under the appointed means, God will bring them to himself. And then in Romans 11, verses 5 and 6, he speaks of God's gracious choice. And in Romans 11, verse 7, he talks about those who were chosen, they have obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Well, I think this gives us a sampling very quickly of God's sovereign election in the book of Romans. So much more can be said. But not only do we see sovereign election, we also see definite atonement. And I'm going to have to quickly look at, at some of these verses, but I would bring to your attention first in Romans 4, verses 23 to 25, it says, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Who is the hour? Well, it's very obvious in this context. The hour refers to believers. Uh, it doesn't speak of the world. It doesn't speak of every person. Uh, it speaks of those who are justified and those who have a right standing before God. And it is these for whom Christ died. Uh, Christ died for his sheep. He died for his church. He did not die for the whole world. If he died for the whole world, then the whole world would be saved. As we come to, uh, to, to Romans uh, chapter 5, we, we see 
uh, in verses 12 to 21. Adam and the second Adam. The first Adam represents all humanity. And what he did has affected the whole human race. When he sinned, we all sinned. But there is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the second Adam. And what he has done has affected his people. And what he did was to die upon the cross for the sins of his new humanity, those who are chosen and those who are elect. But an even greater argument comes in Romans chapter 8. We read that if God is for us, who is against us? Verse 31, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. So the question is, who is the us all? Well, in the context, any Bible student can easily see that it refers to those who are foreknown, those who are predestined, those who are called justified and glorified. In fact, he goes on to identify them in the next verse. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, who intercedes for us. You see, the intercession that Christ is making right now at the right hand of God the Father It is for believers only. John 17, 9 says, I do not intercede for the world. I intercede for those whom you have given me. And those for whom Jesus is interceding at the right hand of the Father are the very same ones for whom he interceded upon Calvary's cross. There is a continuity in his intercession between his heavenly intercession at the right hand of the Father and his earthly intercession as he died upon the cross for the sins of his people. In Romans chapter 8, it is crystal clear that those for whom Jesus died are those whom the Father chose and gave to Him. And not a drop of His blood was wasted upon the cross. Jesus did not die in vain for any for whom He died. All for whom He bore their sins upon the cross, He has taken that sin far, far away. And there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a glorious truth it is that not only has the Father chosen us before time began, but the Son has also died for us And it was a triumphant, victorious death upon the cross. Not one drop of defeat there at Calvary, all for whom Christ died, will receive the fullness of the riches of His grace. Well, may God give us great understanding into these verses because they are verses that honor and glorify God the Father and the Son.